friends welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then just welcome to my channel go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you won't be disappointed unless you don't like good content and then if that's the case you can just exit now today's video is going to be a true crime and makeup if you are new here that is where i sit here in my glam cave and i tell a true crime story and i do my makeup and uh it's a good time if you like true crime yo i swear i don't pre-plan these rhymes I should have I should have been a rapper. Mm. I broke up with my ex-girl. Here's a number. Mm. Mm. What's that shit say? Psych! That's the wrong number! Oh! Today's video is gonna be about Paul Bernardo and his wife Carla Homolka, aka the Ken and Barbie killers, and it will not be a Britney Vaughn video if I just did not mispronounce something, okay? One day, y'all are gonna see a video from me in which I do not struggle to pronounce one single word. Paul Bernardo was born August 27th in 1964 in Scarborough, Scar Scarborough, Canada. I'm sure you heard of it. His family was described as being financially well off. And on the outside, they appear to be like, not the perfect family, but a really good family. Well-to-do, well-put-together, happy family. Unfortunately, they were a little family with some dark secrets, because you see, Paul's father was a creep, and when Paul was 11, he went to jail for sexually molesting a young girl. And he was also said to have molested his own daughter, Paul's sister. To some degree, he abused Paul's mother as well, and when he went to jail, she just went into this deep depression, packed up all her things, and moved into the basement of their home, which is kind of weird, but this seemingly didn't affect Paul because neighbors described him as being a very happy child. They said he smiled a lot, he was a real cute kid, he was a boy scout, he was all of that in a bag of chips. He literally was described as being the perfect child. The little boy that everybody wanted. Well-mannered, doing well in school. Very sweet, you get it. When Paul was 16, his mother decided to come clean to him about a secret she had been hiding from him. I don't know if she was hiding from the whole family, but he didn't know. She let him know that he was conceived illegitimately from an extramarital affair and that his dad, his little molesty father, was not his actual father. This is the thing. If my father went to jail from being, you know, a pervert, being nasty, feeling on little girls, including his own child, I would be somewhat relieved that he wasn't my real father. But this wasn't the case for Paul. He was very upset and this completely changed the dynamic of his relationship with his mother. He was disgusted with her. He pretty much lost all respect for her. He, from that point on, he would insult her all the time and he was just very nasty towards her. He resented her a lot. He felt like she was a whore. Around this time, beneath his very charming facade, he developed very dark sexual fantasies. He started to beat the women that he dated. He would insult them and berate them in public and humiliate them whenever he got the chance. And he was just a horrible guy. In May of 1987, Scarborough Row. I hate saying Scarborough Row. I feel like naturally my tongue does not want me to say Scarborough. It doesn't flow off my tongue, but I'm gonna try to say it for the sake of, you know, you guys. May 1987, the suburb of Scarborough was plagued with a series of horrible, horrible crimes. On May 4th, really, really early in the morning, when it was still dark, a young woman was riding the bus to her parents' house and she was attacked getting off the bus and brutally raped. Now, this was just the first of three that happened within a week. All of the women were between the ages of 15 and 21, and the attacks included beatings, intense verbal abuse, threats to discourage the victims from going to the police or like telling anyone about the attacks, and of course, sexual assault. So yeah, they still went to the police. That didn't really work. And the police concluded that these all had to be carried out by the same person who they dubbed the Scarborough Scarborough rapist who of course was our good friend Paul Bernardo. Carla Leanne Homolka was born May 4th 1970 also in Canada. She seemed like a pretty normal child 
all the way up into a teen years. She was pretty, she was popular, she was smart, she was everything you want your child to be. Except things took a turn for the worse, but we'll get to that. Oh goodness, sort of like my eyebrows. She loved animals, she worked at a vet's office. She really loved animals, and when she was 17, this love for animals led her to a pet convention where she meets Paul Bernardo, the uh, sick creepy rapist we just discussed. I don't know what he was doing there though. He is at this time 23 years old. The two connected instantly and their immediate attraction only intensified when Paul discovered that unlike the other girls he had dated, Miss Carla shared his same sick fantasies. They quickly began a sadomasochistic relationship where Paul was an abusive master and Carla was his willing slave. I'm a slave for you. It's probably not the time for the entire time that they dated, Paul was still out raping the ladies of Scarborough with his girlfriend's approval and encouragement. Most of his victims were women that he caught getting off of bus stops like late night, early morning. And one was a 15 year old girl he actually assaulted in her own bedroom. A couple of his victims were able to fight him off and he was actually questioned by the police twice, twice and let go. From May to September 1990, police had submitted more than 130 suspect samples of DNA testing when they received two leads that the person they were looking for was actually Mr. Paul. And uh, for whatever reason, they just were not trying to take Paul down as a suspect. I don't know if he just didn't look like a creepy rapey weirdo or what, but they really weren't trying to take that serious. The first tip was given by a bank employee and there wasn't really too much detail about why that person thought he was the rapist. The second tip came from the wife of one of Paul's friends. He had these three friends who were brothers and one of their wives was Tina. Tina told detectives that Paul had been called in previously as a suspect for rape and that he openly discussed a lot of his like sick twisted fantasies about rough sex and sodomy and just and she was just very confident that Paul was their guy. He also looked a lot like the description and the composite sketch that they had from the victims. He was literally being handed to detectives on a silver platter. But apparently because Tina had a speech impediment how ridiculous is this? Tina had a speech impediment that left them uncertain whether to take her serious like what? Finally though, they decide to interview Paul and the interview lasted only 35 minutes. It took place in November 1990 and um, he willingly gave a DNA sample to detectives. He was just like, oh, here's a little piece of my hair before I go run that. The detectives asked Paul why he thought that he was being investigated for the rapes. He was like, I mean, I do kind of look like the guy in reference to the composite sketches like sir. According to the detectives, they found him to be far more credible than Tina, whom they suspected was just trying to get the reward. And they let Paul go. So Paul and Carla become engaged and she, at this point in their life, she describes to friends that they're just as happy as they've ever been. That they're happier than ever. That Paul is just so romantic. He's so perfect. He's so sweet. Just all of that. But the truth is, three years into their relationship, Paul started to get bored with Carla and he specifically would complain that she was not a virgin when they met and that bothered him, he needed a virgin, and that her 15 year old sister Tammy had become the subject of his sick, twisted fantasies and she pretty much had his full attention. And um, I'm sure you or I would be like, bitch, what? But we would have been like that a long time ago. And yet again, instead of Paula being outraged at her nasty little husband's sick, twisted fantasies and desires, she encouraged them. Even when it came down to her own sister, like, I just don't get it. What's wrong with you, girl? Carla, in an effort to get her husband close to Tammy, her 15-year-old sister, began to hang out with her sister a lot around their parents' house and like take Tammy out to party. They would supply her with beer and just really, I guess, gain her trust. Paul like literally becomes obsessed with Tammy, like literally obsessed. Carla was allowing him access to Tammy's bedroom when she would fall asleep. He would go in 
watch her sleep, masturbate while she was sleeping. Peer into her bedroom while she was changing at night. <sighs> it was all mess. So it gets to the point that Carla tells Paul that she wants him to have her sister's virginity as a Christmas present. Like, girl, that's not yours to give away. That's not yours. How sick do you have to be? On December 23rd, 1990, the Homolkas, which is Carla's parents, they have a Christmas party. And of course, they don't know that their daughter, Carla, is a sick, twisted bitch. So her and her man are invited. And they love Paul, by the way. Like, they literally had no clue the type of person that he was. They didn't have a clue of what type of person that their daughter was. They loved them both. Carla gets some horse tranquilizers from her job. Because remember, she's a little old veterinarian assistant. Ain't no telling what she was in there doing to the animals. She spiked her sister's drink with the horse tranquilizers. And that night, while the rest of the family was asleep and sweet, innocent, old 15-year-old Tammy was drugged up on horse tranquilizers. Carla holds a cloth soaked in halothane over her sister's mouth and takes turns with her fiancé raping her. And the whole time, they're videotaping, like, this upsets me. In the midst of this whole terrible, terrible act, Tammy begins to vomit. And because she's laying on her back, she starts to choke on the vomit. The couple panics and they try to clean up, hide the evidence, then call the ambulance. But unfortunately, the young teen never regains consciousness and she is pronounced dead at the hospital. Now, although the chemical burn from the halothane on her face was noted, the drugs in her system were not detected and her death was ruled an accident as the result of choking on vomit due to alcohol poisoning. Now, I love blue eyeshadow looks, but the fallout is always so hectic. <sighs> we gonna get through it though. Be gonna get through of course because her death was ruled an accident no investigation was done and it was just that was just it it was dubbed a terrible accident and you know how serial killers get down once they get away with something this usually just sends them out like they get so much confidence and then it's just a spree carla befriends a 15 year old girl that works with her and because the girl was only 15 her identity was protected so we don't know her real name we'll call her stacy because that's a cute little nice name for a nice sweet innocent 15 year old in the summer of 1991 june 7th to be exact the following year after they killed tammy carla's sick ass invites stacy out for a girls night out they go out shopping they go out to eat and then they go back to tammy's house which little does stacy know it's tammy and paul's house together Paul is hiding somewhere under a kitchen sink somewhere. I don't know. Anywho, she starts to give the girl alcohol, which is laced. And as soon as Stacy passes out, Carla calls Paul to tell him that his surprise wedding gift was ready, which was unconscious Stacy. I hate people. They undress Stacy, and Paul begins videotaping as Carla begins to assault her sexually. And then he proceeds to take his turn assaulting her sexually sodomizing her just just being nasty the next morning stacy wakes up paul is nowhere to be found and she's very sick but she thinks that it's just because she had a hangover because she had been drinking the night before and she didn't even realize that she had been sexually assaulted so they got away with that so June 15, 1991 just literally a couple days after the incident with stacy paul is out trolling and being just being the nasty man that he is right he runs into a 14 year old who is locked outside of her home because she stayed out past curfew. Her name was Leslie Mahaffey. Paul approaches her. She asks him for cigarettes and he lures her to his car. He's like, sure, I got some cigarettes, girl. They right over here. He blindfolds the girl, forces her into the car and drives her to his home with Carla. And they of course do what they do. They take turns sexually assaulting the girl. They're filming the whole incident because that's just how they get down. Paul tells Leslie how she's doing such a great job because apparently she just she wasn't making too much noise and he told her that the next two hours would determine her fate like what they end up doing with her whether they let her go or they kill her off so she is trying to play their game and just comply with their requests just you know so she lives the entire time she's still blindfolded like from the time he throws her in the car and so he tells her you know because she has not that good of a chance of identifying them that she had a good chance of being let go but apparently at some point her blindfold begins to slip and so at that point they decide we can't just let her go 
which I don't think they were planning to let her ass go in anyway, but they keep her overnight and Paul claimed that Carla fed the girl a lethal dose of Halcyon. I think that's how you pronounce. Whatever she was using to drug the girls, she gave Leslie a lethal dose of and that's what killed her. But Carla said that it was actually Paul who strangled the girl and that's how she died. So then they stuffed Leslie's body in the basement because the very next day, Carla's family was due to come over and have dinner, which they do. They come over, have dinner the next night, unbeknownst to them, over the body of 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey. After Carla's family leaves, Carla and Paul decide that the best way to get rid of Leslie's body is to dismember her and encase each piece of her pieces in cement and drop it in water. Very theatrical, if you ask me. Like, y'all watch too many movies. Paul goes on to buy a dozen bags of cement at a hardware store and he kept the receipts which at his trial were very very much damaging like and then Paul went and got his grandfather's circular saw to help with the dismembering of Leslie's body. Together the couple makes several trips to a nearby lake it was like 11 miles from their home to drop the individual pieces of cement that encased all of her body parts into the lake and one block was about 200 pounds and they were not able to lift it up so they literally just left it right there on the curbside of the lake is the side of a lake called a curbside or no is no curb there you know what i mean a couple days later on june 29th 1991 the couple gets married a match made in hell like you gotta admit kind of belong together they also belong in hell the same day that they tied the knot, a father and son who were fishing in the lake that they disposed of Leslie's body discovers the concrete block containing human body parts. So of course they report it to the police, an investigation is done, and then they uncover these cement blocks containing all of these body parts. Unfortunately, the couple was not immediately able to be tied to this crime. April 16th, 1992, a year after that the couple was driving around a catholic school high school looking for their next victim and they run into 15 year old kirsten french who is walking home they pull into the parking lot of a nearby church carla hops out of the car with a map in her hand pretending to be lost needing directions and kristen being just like the nice sweet girl nice samaritan wanting to help she offers her assistance to carla and as soon as she starts to look at the map, Paul attacks her from behind, showing her a knife and forcing her into the front seat of their car. Carla gets in the back seat behind French and she is controlling the girl by holding onto her hair from behind. So Kristen French took the same route home every day and apparently she lived very close to the school. It only took her 15 minutes to get home and she had a routine of taking care of the family dog. So when she does not show up in good time, her family wastes no time alerting the authorities. They immediately suspect that Kirsten was met with some sort of foul play. Police assemble a search party and found several witnesses that had witnessed the abduction like from different angles yep i just i just fucked up my eyeliner terribly i got one going out one going up this is a mess girl how do you even fix this i don't think i can i have to call on jesus jesus like girl i can't even fix it let me try to fix this because i gotta i got somewhere to go today french's shoe was also left behind in the parking lot like a true crime version of cinderella all right, that's more like it. Now they ain't twins, but hell, they at least sisters. So we just gonna, we gonna take what we can get. We gonna roll with that. Unfortunately, even with the witnesses, they are unable to identify Paul and Carla as the, as the abductors. The couple spends the entire Easter weekend videotaping themselves, torturing, sodomizing, and raping French, force feeding her large amounts of alcohol. And it was said at Paul's trial that he always had intentions of killing her because she was never blindfolded and would have been able to identify her captors had they released her, which is a good point. So when the couple got through with Kirsten, they murdered her and proceeded to go to Carla's family's for Easter dinner the same day that they killed her. And again, during their trial, they blamed it on each other. Paul claimed that Carla beat Kirsten with a rubber mallet when she tried to escape. 
and then strangled her and then of course carla said no nah, it was paul 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 did it approximately two weeks after her abduction kirsten's nude body was found on april 30th in a ditch about 45 minutes from the high school she was abducted from sad she had been washed and her hair cut off. At first it was thought that the killer had removed her hair as a trophy, but later in the trial it came out that Carla had removed her hair in an effort to impede investigation, like so she couldn't be identified quickly, which was kind of stupid, but I guess, hell, Carla hadn't proved herself to be that smart to this point, so. Now, Paul was always abusive to Carla, but apparently in January of 1993, she had got tired of it because he dealt her a particularly very vicious beating with a flashlight and so she felt like that was it she wasn't gonna take no more that was the straw that broke Carla's back she left her husband and within two months after leaving Paul the DNA samples that he had given 26 months ago remember when he was interviewed by the detectives for being the Scarborough rapist yeah those came back as a match for Paul he was put under surveillance for a couple of weeks and then he was arrested in February of 1993 realizing that shit had hit the fan and the jig was up Carla sought out a file a lawyer and she saw a plea bargain in exchange for her testifying against her husband Paul she claimed that Paul had attacked over 30 women and that she herself was a victim of Paul he abused her he manipulated her he threatened her and she was just an unwilling participant she was afraid for her life to leave Paul was a monster she was just scared she couldn't leave him the government agreed to a short little 12 year sentence for Carla in exchange for her cooperation which dramatically backfired because Paul was like hold up no 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 you are not a victim and then he released the tapes and then it was like girl he had evidence on tape of her being more than a willing participant. The tapes exposed Carla's true nature as being the monster that she was instead of the abused victim that she tried to portray herself to be. They were like, girl, you was what now? Even still, Carla didn't do much time. She was released in 2005. She remarried. She had a family. She changed her name. She got herself a whole new life. She even had like some kids. I want to know who married this girl and if they know about her checkered past. Cause punk ass Paul was found guilty on all charges and sentenced to life in prison. His application for parole in 2018 after 25 years of imprisonment was denied. After only 30 minutes of deliberation, they weren't trying to add it. They like, girl, girl, no. A lawyer on behalf of the victim's families reported that there's never been an apology from Paul and there wasn't. There's never been any inclination whatsoever of remorse. Paul even admitted to the courts himself that he never felt anything for the victim at the time of his sadistic, horrific crimes. And that's part of the reason why his ass is still behind bars, which he should stay and what Carla should be. You know what? I forgot to put my little, gotta put my girls back. So that's pretty much the end of this story. Paul is still in jail. If y'all want to write him some hate mail, I encourage it. I mean, not that it takes away any of the pain that you caused to the families, but why not apologize? Like, it doesn't hurt anything. But anyway, that is it for this video and this story. If you like the video, if you like the look, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up. It helps me out tremendously. Comment your thoughts down below. Product details will be listed in the description box. And uh, as always, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will see you in the next one. Peace. Ew, 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 ew. Let me get a thumbnail because... Girl, I be looking crazy in my thumbnails and I need to get a cute little thumbnail.